Saga Podcast. And welcome back to the Space Arena Ground Arena Saga Podcast, where we cover Star Wars Unlimited from the ground up into space. I'm Mr. Ben, and today we are going to be going over my favorite set one leader, Thrawn. We're going to be talking about the deck that I've been working on since before the game came out to make this leader into the tier S powerhouse that I know he can be. So the first thing I want to do before we even get into talking about the card specifically is I want to define a handful of terms. So there is some slang, some jargon that is really common in card game spaces, but if Star Wars Unlimited is your first TCG, you may not have encountered these terms before, and they're gonna come out of my mouth when I talk about this deck, so I wanna make sure we're all on the same page. Mill. Now, the term mill comes from Magic the Gathering. It's reference to a very famous magic card, the Millstone, takes cards off the top of a player's deck and puts them directly into their graveyard discard pile, KO pile. We have kind of a similar effect here in Star Wars Unlimited, but it's not called mill. However, you will hear people referring to milling cards or milling off the deck. This is always what they're talking about, discarding cards off the top of the deck, taking them from the deck straight into the KO pile. Along these same lines, there's the concept of being decked or decking out. In Magic, if you're library if your deck is empty of cards and you have to draw from it you just lose the game so you deck out you lost now it doesn't work quite like that in star wars but there is also a penalty in this game for having an empty deck and the reference point for this empty deck damage comes from hearthstone which is a digital ccg where when your deck is empty, every time you go to draw a card, you take an amount of damage that scales up over time. Now in Star Wars, the damage is static. Every time you're supposed to draw from an empty deck, you take three damage. So this translates into six damage per draw phase every time we go through a turn once your deck is empty. In Hearthstone, this damage is referred to as fatigue damage. In Star Wars Unlimited, we do not have a special name for it. It's just empty deck damage or draw damage, but it's going to often be referred to as fatigue damage in this video, as well as across the discussion about decks that are going to be trying to make use of these mechanics. Cards being exhausted or tapped. I will probably say tapped at some point. Again, this comes from magic. It, it means exhausted. Same thing. So lastly, there's one other kind of like slang jargon uh, definition that I want to make sure we're all on the same page with for this. And that is when I say turn six, I mean the turn where we have six resources. When I say turn eight, I mean the turn where we have eight resources. I know that technically because we start on turn two, turn three, three resource turn is actually turn two. That's just not, it makes it clumsy to talk about. We all know what I'm saying. So when I say turn seven, I actually mean turn six. I mean the turn where we have seven resources. Okay, so with all that out of the way, with all of our definitions, this is the, the prologue to the preamble. Let's get into actually talking about Thrawn. So Thrawn on his undeployed side has the ability when the action phase starts, look at the top card of each player's deck. This is the most critical, most important, most crucial, cannot be overstated element of our entire deck. This, this ability is the backbone to everything else we're doing. You've got to not only look at the cards on the top of the deck and make note of the cost, that's really important for the rest of Thrawn's power, but you also need to know what's coming and know how your opponent's draws are gonna line up against your removal. We don't have perfect information about what their draws are, but we're gonna know what half their draws are. And that should be enough information to make informed choices and pick good lines and make sure that we stay in control of this game. So to continue moving down Thrawn's undeployed side, he has an action ability that costs one, you exhaust him, and you reveal the top card of any player's deck and exhaust a unit that costs the same as or less than the revealed card. This is our first control tool, our first of many, and it's one that you're going to be using maybe not every turn, but close to every turn of the game. You want to be, as much as possible, revealing cards off your opponent's deck to exhaust their units. Well, at least one per turn, and on your deploy turn, potentially two, although that may not be the line you go after every time. Once Thrawn deploys, which he can do starting on turn six, although generally I don't deploy until after my first super laser blast, 
But once he deploys, he maintains the when the action phase starts power to look at the top card of both your deck and your opponent's deck. But now his exhaust ability triggers when he attacks. So you have to be able to get an attack off with this guy in order to use the exhaust power. It is actually easier to just pay the one and exhaust him on his undeployed side to make sure you're getting things locked down. But there may be places, particularly in aggressive matchups, where you have to deploy on six or seven to just get out to the board and start killing things and trying to do something with the leader. That's not plan A, but it is definitely something that comes up when you're playing this deck. Okay, so now that we've taken a look at Thrawn, I want to get into the preamble before we get into the deck guide, where I talk about some of the other things that you could do with this character that I ended up steering away from. And the first version of the deck uh, that I wanted to try out was going with just pure cunning, doubling down on Thrawn in the yellow aspect. And that was on the back of how powerful the double down cunning cards are. Bodhi being a unit plus a spark of rebellion to get something out of your opponent's hand, the cantina bouncer being a waylay plus a body, and of course cunning, which is a card I'll go into in depth later in the video. The issue I ran into with trying to play a pure cunning Thrawn list is we want to be a slow, deliberate deck that's going to go into the late game and have some really cool things to do at the top end. And when you're playing only cunning cards, there just isn't that much to do. There just isn't enough to do at the top end. So the boss monster for the cunning aspect on Villainy is the 8-cost Chimera. This is probably the weakest of all the Star Destroyers, but it does have some use, and I'll talk about that card in depth a little bit later. The other big bomb at the top of the cunning villainy curve is I had no choice. And this card lets you potentially choose two units, putting one back into the deck and one into your opponent's hand. This is not what I want to be doing, because if you're running this, there are absolutely going to be board states where you have a must remove unit in play and just one. So you're paying seven to essentially waylay a unit. I am not interested in overpaying four for a waylay. So pretty quickly, I realized cunning, at least within the set one meta, just isn't going to get it done for a long game, slow playing control deck like Thrawn. So the next aspect that I figured I would take a look at is command. And it's kind of obvious to see why Thrawn would want to play in command. The Relentless and the Devastator at the top end of the command curve are some of the strongest, some of the best boss monsters you can have in the game. These curve toppers are actually things that I'm a little jealous of playing in Vigilance and Cunning like I am. And these are cards that are a real threat to what we're doing. So once we get into the deck guide, I want to talk about both Relentless and Devastator in more depth because these are cards you have to be aware of and have to know what the counterplay is if you're going to try to play these long games. Darth Vader, I don't feel like I need to say a lot about this guy. Just look at his price tag and <laughs> You can kind of understand how this is a very strong card. The other aspect to command that was very appealing for Thrawn is the ability to get to these end game boss monsters much more quickly than other aspects do with the super laser technician and of course resupply. These are really good cards. And while command also has overwhelming barrage as one of the best removal slash buff cards that you can play in the whole game, ultimately I found the package to really suffer in terms of having enough to do in the early game to really make sure we got there. Again, this is a hard control deck. So early turns, I don't want to be fighting for board. I don't want to be fielding a bunch of little units to try to make sure that I'm, I'm doing honest combats with you. No, 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 no. That's not what we do with the Thrawn list. Uh, lastly, I while I have landed on the vigilance aspect as being the place that I think Thrawn has the best shot at winning. There was a bunch of different versions of this deck before I landed on the one that I'm at now. Each of the cards that I'm picturing here are cards that performed very well, cards that are valuable. Honestly, even Syndicate Lackeys should probably be on this list. But Greedo, a three damage one drop that has the potential to pull a event off the top of your deck and deal another two damage. So essentially you're paying one for five. That's really good. Death Trooper, three attack unit that can deal two damage when it comes into play. So you're paying three for five. That's not as good as Greedo, but more reliable. Childson is a card I've kind of had a love-hate relationship with. On the one hand, I really do love paying for resources to have a 6-6 six, six Sentinel come down. But on the other hand, I really don't like revealing my hand to my opponent. And particularly when what I'm trying to do is get the edge in hand knowledge, deck information. I want to know more about your deck than you know about about mine. I feel like Childson kind of 
slowed me down there. It, it didn't let me get as far ahead on like game state knowledge as I wanted to be. Further, he puts pressure on what you resource. Sometimes the correct card in the situation to resource is a blue card and you don't wanna do it because you know next turn you're gonna play Childson and that's gonna make your Childson weaker. I didn't like any of those pressures on the build and ultimately for those reasons I, I kind of moved away from him. System patrol craft, I really have no criticisms for uh, as far as putting something in the way in the space arena to try to make your opponents deal with it. It's good at all of that. I just stepped further and further away from units as I develop the deck. Kind of the, the same analysis for these other cards. Regional Governor is really good when you can lock out that early game super laser tech or some other important card. It has kind of pseudo sentinel in that people will always go after the Regional Governor if it's in play and you successfully called something that they want to play. Bosk slash Syndicate Lackeys are really good turn five plays to come down, kill something. Bosk, of course, has more potential upside than the, the Syndicate Lackeys, but both of those cards are good in that five slot. And of course, Cargo Juggernaut, decent body, and we definitely do need healing in this deck. So with all that said, let's actually get to looking at the deck. Finally, the prologue, the preamble, here we go. So this deck is called And I Will Whisper Nope. There's a couple of references in there for those that are old enough to get them. And the first thing you'll observe is that in this deck, we are running very, very low unit count. This deck is very dependent on Thrawn's ability as well as our event kit to kind of keep the board under control. So let's go ahead and dive into talking about some of the cards. And I want to start by talking about the most important cards, the cards that kind of make the deck work. And of course, the most important card in the deck is Super Laser Blast. Without this card, I think the deck falls apart. Now, I run three copies of it, not necessarily because I want to play three copies in every single matchup, but because I have to hit this card, usually twice. Usually the first Super Laser Blast, people see it coming. They have enough resources held back that they're able to redevelop to the board, and we need to be able to wipe that board at least twice in most games to make sure that we can take control. This card is really important. It is fundamental to the, the way I have built the deck because I don't have a lot of ways to deal with the board by actually deploying units and, and fighting honestly for board. Kind of along the same lines, the Avenger is probably our most critical, crucial unit. This thing kills something when it comes into play. Of course, it can't kill a leader. So, so there are situations where you're going to want to play Power of Dark Side rather than Avenger if that leader is in play. Uh, but if you get a swing with this thing, once, twice, sometimes that can just be enough to put the game to bed. It's important to remember sometimes the correct line is not to attack the base. As tempting as it is to just bank eight damage into the base, it should be remembered that if you attack into a unit, they still have to kill another unit. So you can put people in really ugly situations where they kind of end up two for one in themselves, especially if you just declare the attack. OK, the on attack triggers, what are you killing? Oh, you're going to kill the thing I attacked? All right, so I don't take any damage yet. Well, wait, what do you mean you don't take damage? Pay attention to the sequencing of it. The on attack should trigger first. So there are definitely going to be times where you're going to be able to get two for ones with this card, which is really, really nice. So if Super Laser Blast and Avenger are sort of like the, the frosting to our control cake, we need to look at some of the other cards, like the, the bulk of the cake that make makes us able to get to those later turns to play these super impactful plays. So let's take a look at Power of the Dark Side. Now, I mentioned this already. This is one of the cleanest, one of the best removals. The problem or the difficulty that you have to navigate around this removal is your opponent gets to make the choice. So ideally, when you play this is when they only have one unit. You set them up in such a way that they cannot choose something that is good for them. All the choices are bad and all of that is good for you. This is a very strong removal, but the more units your opponent plays, the less effective it gets. They're always going to choose the thing that's the worst for you. So this one, particularly if you have a couple of them in your hand early game, a line to keep in mind is it is sometimes just correct to play this on turn three, use your whole turn three to remove whatever they recruited on turn one. While it does kind of suck to pay three to remove a two cost unit, if you have another one of these in hand, after they develop, you claim, and then starting the subsequent turn, you play this again and kill whatever the one thing was that they played. So yes, this is a very strong card. Next up, we have Takedown. This is a key removal for any leader that has five or less remaining hit points. You hold on to this. If you know Sabine is coming, 
this is the card you want on turn four. Aiden, it, just any hero, any leader that has five or less health, this is a very clean way to deal with that. Sometimes this is also the right thing to do to just get that a wing out of the space arena that you can't deal with instead of taking three damage every single turn as it smashes you over and over again while i would say probably the primary the best use case for takedown is to make sure you're clipping a leader cleanly before they get any value or get to attack or anything with them this is certainly a card that has other uses sometimes taking out some kind of a non-leader unit is the right thing to do with this Moving up the curve, we have Vanquish. Now I do only run two copies of Vanquish, and that's because it can be a little clunky. It is an expensive removal, and there are gonna be times where you're gonna have to play this on something small, like a, a Boba Fett or something, and that's not ideal. What we want this for is late game. We want our opponent to play Devastator, and then we Vanquish it immediately. So in the more aggressive matchups, Vanquish is a card that you can potentially side out to get a little bit more early game control. This is a slower card, but it's just such a clean way to deal with non-leader units. You really can't get away with not playing it. Now, if you'll notice, we've gone three, four, five right up the curve with good, strong vigilance removal cards the whole way. This is what we wanna be doing with this deck. We, the whole time, we wanna keep the opponent's board as naked as possible. We want their board to look like our board. So once we get up to the top, we have Count Dooku. Uh, this is a unit, of course, very few units in this deck, but this is a, a one of our sort of mid-game units that can come down and eliminate something with health four or less. So it's not quite as good as a takedown, quite a bit more expensive than a takedown, but we also get a shielded unit along with it. You do need to be careful with this guy in conjunction with entrenched in the ground arena make sure you're not giving your opponent value or something to swing into particularly if they have units that have overwhelm so there are situations where he just ends up hitting the row every time but as a body plus a removal this is what we want to see from our cards we want this guy to come down and kill something with his win played ability and then be able to attack maybe once into something kill something else maybe even three times and get a three for one with this guy it depending upon how it works out with his shield Make an opening. So this lines up well some games and really poorly other games. This card excels when you're able to actually hit things like a Viper Probe Droid and just cleanly kill a unit because it only has two health. It can also later in the game be used in conjunction with something like Count Dooku or Takedown to make sure that you hit the breakpoint that you need that unit at to be able to kill it with the, the five or less or the four or less, depending upon which card you're trying to use against it. And crucially, if this card just gave a unit minus two, minus two, it probably wouldn't make the cut here. But the crucial thing that this does, in addition to being a removal, it also gives us some healing. Because we are a slow control deck and because we play so few units, we are going to take some damage early game. We are going to get beat up a little bit and we need ways to offset that and undo the damage that we take to our base during those early turns. Another single target removal. Now, Waylay is less a removal and it is more a delay. So it is true that if you play this on something like a Ruthless Raider, that Ruthless Raider just comes right back down and does another four damage across unit and base. So this is not a good clean answer to all the different types of threats that exist out there in the game. But this is a particularly nice answer when somebody does something like plays a wing leader and buffs up their turn one play and then before they get a chance to attack with that buffed up battlefield marine, you waylay them back to hand. So you're getting that extra value. It's not just that you're slowing them down from that one attack. You're also erasing those experience tokens that got put on the unit. This, of course, applies to all sorts of other upgrades, Jedi lightsabers, electro staffs. There's a lot of nonsense flying around out there. And this, in a way, can create a two for one if you waylay a unit that has been buffed up with some of these upgrades. Kind of along a similar lines where it's not really a removal, but a delay. No good to me dead. This card is very strong. I don't think that this card has quite the level of attention that it deserves because it can really shut down particularly leaders that need to attack on their deploy turn. Han Solo is maybe the best example because he deploys and then he immediately wants to be able to attack to get up to that extra resource, generally trying to get to turn seven and do something really gross like play Ewing. No Good To Me Dead shuts off Han Solo from being able to attack not only on his deploy turn, but the next turn. Another very popular leader that relies pretty heavily on his ability to attack is Boba Fett. If Boba Fett can't attack, he can't ready resources, and he can't squeeze that extra value out in the mid game that really gives those Boba Fett decks their oomph. 
So no good to me dead, kind of like waylaid. This is not a clean removal. This is not solving the problem. It's just delaying the problem. But delaying a problem for two turns sometimes is just enough to be able to get you to where you can solve the problem. Uh, another single target answer we have is Entrenched. This card is so frustrating. People get so mad when they play their cool unit and they put that Jedi lightsaber on him and they're about to attack and instead I throw an Entrenched down. I'm like, wow, your guy's really big. Can't attack me, but he sure is big. Very rarely, this will go on to one of our early game units, a Bib, maybe an Inferno 4, and you just start attacking and fighting for board with it. That is very much an edge case that's not ideal but in really aggressive mashups sometimes we have to be a little bit more aggressive not to push damage to base but to make sure that we're controlling the board and cleaning the board up so in an ideal world this is the kind of card that somebody plays darth vader we play this somebody plays devastator we play this we lock people down this is really good on people's leaders again for the same reason that no good to me dead is good if i put this on your leader and i don't play any ground units you can't attack Darth Vader can't do his ping. Uh, any of the leaders that have cool stuff that happens when you attack, Leia, uh, any of them, you put entrenched on them and you don't play units for them to attack into, and they look a lot worse. That steadfast battalion, yeah, sure, 8-8 eight, eight is a big set of stats, but if you don't have anything to attack and push that overwhelmed damage through my unit into my base, it's a paper tiger. It's not doing anything. So we've gone through a bunch of our single target removals, but we we know we know that single target removals are not going to be good enough. At a certain point, we're going to have to be getting two for ones, maybe three for ones to try to survive in this game. So let's move into some of the answers we have for when people go really wide, because that is a danger in this deck. Wide boards are a threat to Thrawn. First up, we have Outmaneuver. This is a card that I have gotten the, man, that's overpowered. Man, that's toxic. More than any other card. People do not like this card. I mean, in general, people don't like to be controlled. They want to play their units and they want to attack with their units. And what I'm doing is not letting them attack with their units. Now, outmaneuver becomes much less valuable if somebody's splitting their units between space and ground. But not every deck is capable of doing that. Not every deck thinks about doing that. So if somebody's got four, five ground units out and you outmaneuver them, that's like a five for one in terms of disruption. That is excellent. This card saves you so many times when somebody really feels like they're loading up the board. They're trying to push that damage in and get you dead before you can hit that super laser blast. Outmaneuver is one of those cards, especially if you have the initiative, you get to go first and you just wipe out a whole arena and they don't get to attack at all. It's wonderful. Okay, now we're going to get into some of the spicier cards. Cunning. Now, yes, we are paying six for cunning, and that does instinctively feel bad to overpay for a card, but I would argue this card is perfectly fine at six, and we're not always going to pay six for it, which I'll get to in a little bit. So let's go through the various modes of this. So the, the I'll take them from in order from least used to most used. So the least used mode is giving a unit plus four attack. Now, there are going to be times where you have an Avenger in play, you turn it into a 12 attack unit, and you just attack in for lethal and win the game. Being able to burst for an extra four out of nowhere is a big, meaningful number, but that's not really our plan A. That's not what, really what we're trying to do. And the only time we're really going to use that burst mode is if we have a really critical unit that has to die. We can't bounce it. We can't exhaust it. It has to die. And we have something that we can actually put that plus four on to attack into it. So we're going to see this pretty rarely. Every once in a while, it will turn into a... Uh, facilitating a removal. Every once in a while, it will turn into facilitating lethal, but this is going to be our least picked option. The third least picked option is forcing an opponent to discard a random card. Now, this is another one that at times feels really good, especially if it's later in the game. Maybe they only have one card in hand and you just force them to get rid of it, or maybe they played that K2SO you return it to their hand with one of the other modes on this card and then force them to discard it, getting no value out of his win defeated ability. So there are some cheeky things you can do to really irritate your opponent and whittle down their resources. If they have no cards left to draw in their deck and they're only playing with cards from hand, forcing someone to discard a random card. And the word random does a lot of heavy lifting here. It's not them picking the worst card in their hand. It's random. So it can end up being the best card in their hand. Now we'll move into the real reason this card is played. 
return a non-leader unit with four or less power to its owner's hand. This is just a clean removal. This is a waylay. This, uh, yes, it's a limited waylay, but it can get a really problematic unit out of the way. It is limited by four or less power. So somebody plays a three attack thing and then they wing leader at it. And well, now you can't use cunning to bounce it back to hand anymore. That's unfortunate. It still works a significant percent of the time. And finally, the, the jewel of this card is exhaust up to two units. So if we are on turn six and we play this, we can exhaust two units and bounce one. So we're reaching out and touching three units on the board. On turn five, when we have five resources, touching three units is probably the whole field. That's probably everything your opponent has in all their arenas. Not always, but often. On turn six, when maybe we use Bib to play this for five and then also have Thrawn's power available, well, now we've touched four units across the board, which again, this is what we want to do. We want to be able to eliminate threats. And sometimes the way we eliminate that threat is we just exhaust something. So it doesn't necessarily always eliminate it. It just delays it. But that's OK, because we're delaying to a point. We have somewhere where we're going. This card is an absolute knockout, an MVP in the deck to be able to get three for ones, facilitate, facilitate attacking the hand. It, it does a lot. It's very flexible. And depending upon where you play it, this card wins games. This card is very, very good. And on top of that, it has a card player playing cards in the card art. So this is kind of a bullseye for this maybe to become one of my favorite cards in the set, probably my favorite card in, in set one. Okay, sticking with the theme of overpaying, we are paying six for Vigilance in this deck. Now, I have to give credit to Copycat99 from the Let's Build the Best Thrawn chat on the Star Wars Unlimited Discord. That was the first person I saw suggesting trying Vigilance out in the Thrawn deck, and my initial reaction was, ah, paying six, that can't be good. It is good. It is very good. It is game-winningly good. It is the reason I took time at the top of this video to define things like fatigue damage and mill. So looking at this card for the things that it does, give a shield token to a unit. I've never used that mode. I, I can see a world where I might want to, but it, I have never encountered that actually in a game state. I've never used that mode. Defeat a unit with three or less remaining HP. This is pretty crucial in those Ag aggressive matchups. If an aggro deck is trying to run you down, sometimes what you need to do is bib this thing out on turn five and heal and kill something. The heal did five damage from a base. We pick this every time, no matter what. Every single time, we always heal five. The two copies of Vigilance in this deck lets us heal for 10. That's a big number. That's a number that can sometimes completely undo. We can heal down to zero sometimes based on Vigilance. And finally, discard six cards from an opponent's deck. Now, this is a very important power. If we're going up against other kind of slower mid-range decks or other control decks, this is our win condition. We take 12 cards out of their deck. We heal for 10 off casting Vigilance twice. That puts us in the position where they enter fatigue. They've lost a ton of their resources, a ton, a ton of potential things they could do to hurt us straight to the KO pile. And then they start taking that fatigue damage at six per turn. And that's how we win the game. That's how we win the control mirrors. That's how we win some of our mid-range games. This card, even if we're not choosing, again, not choosing the six, it can kill something with three or less remaining HP and heal us. So it has value in the aggro matchup as well. This card is phenomenal. Now, often what happens when I play a game of one against someone is they don't know what's happening. And then when they realize what's happening, they don't like being decked out. So when we go into game two, Rather than taking some of their sideboard and taking things out, they just grab all 10 cards and they come at me with 60 cards. So I'll talk about the answer to that a little bit later once we get through the main list. But I do have I do have a couple things that I do to deal with people trying to counterplay us, pushing them into fatigue damage, which is what we want to do. We want you to go into fatigue. Okay, Boba Fett. So this guy kind of counts like a removal with Thrawn's ability to exhaust a unit. You can you can get his on attack off more often than you would maybe in some other decks where you don't have that built-in leader power to exhaust something. He does come down and fight for board some of the time, 
but I find what he does more than come down and fight for board is he sucks removal out of my opponent's hand. People don't like the idea that you can use Boba Fett to swing into their shore trooper and kill the shore trooper without doing any return damage to Boba. And I feel like there's a tendency to overreact to this guy. He pulls removals out of the opponent's hand, and that means they won't have them later for things like Dooku and Avenger, which are the units that we actually care about sticking to the board. At just a 3-5, this guy's probably playable like that, and his ability to potentially reach for six and always reach for six into exhausted leaders makes this a really, really strong three draw. And I feel like it, it, with how few units we have, the units that are here have to be like the best of the best, and that's kind of where Boba Fett falls. All right, Bib Fortuna. Now this guy, if what we've talked about so far is our main game plan and the control infrastructure that we use to get to the late game. Bib is like grease on those skids. Bib is the scaffolding that lets us build the infrastructure. So in some games, I'll, I'll get the rarest case out, out of the way first. In some games, you just play this guy as a shielded 1-3 and he has to go to work on the board. Maybe you throw an entrenched on him and he has to start cracking into units to try to keep the board clear. Very rare. This does not happen that often. More often what you do with this guy, probably the best play for this guy is you get him down on the board, turn six towards the bottom of the turn. So your opponent doesn't have a lot of chances to remove him or exhaust him. And starting turn seven, you exhaust him and you play a seven cost super laser blast, wipe the board, deploy your leader on your next action, kill whatever they play it after the super laser. That that's kind of plan a another excellent use case for this guy is to facilitate doing a power of the dark side for two on the three resource turn and then having one resource left over to exhaust something else or play cunning on turn five or play vigilance on turn six plus exhaust something. So there's a lot of different ways that we can do the math in this deck. If you look at our cards, there's a lot of ways to do the math to add these removals together to make sure that you're maximizing the value that you get, maximizing the disruption, trying to spend all your resources. And there's a lot of turns where that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be mix and matching. Well, I could play outmaneuver plus entrenched here, or I could set up bib for the next turn. And you have to be thinking a couple of turns ahead. Otherwise, the deck just starts to fall apart. OK, Inferno 4. So this is another uh, scaffolding character at 2-3. It isn't going to do us a lot in space, although sometimes people don't want to swing their their A-wings into this thing. They crash three damage into the base and it takes us two turns, but we do get that A-wing out of there with Inferno 4. So sometimes this thing can fight, but really it's not doing much fighting with only two attack. The main purpose this serves in the deck is it lets you look at the top two cards of your deck. Sometimes that's crucial just to be able to set up the Thrawn exhaust. Like if you have a one cost something on top of your deck and now oh, super laser, put that on top. Now I can exhaust that leader, something like that. It happens when it comes into play and when it gets killed, but even more than setting up good Thrawn exhaust turns, I think the real purpose of this is it lets you throw cards that aren't appropriate for the situation to the bottom of your deck. If you look at the top of your deck and you're dealing with a situation where you've got one space unit and one ground unit and your draw is outmaneuver, well, that's not the answer you need. You need a cunning or a no good, like you need something different to deal with the split arena. So maybe you throw that out maneuver to the bottom. This lets us fix our draw to make sure we're hitting the cards we need. Often when you play this earlier in the game, you're going to be throwing things to the bottom until you've got that super laser lined up. Okay, search your feelings. Now this, this might be a more controversial inclusion in the deck. I will fully acknowledge that paying for to go search for something is not great. Uh, we are trying to win the game in fatigue damage, which means taking cards out of our deck gets us closer to running out of cards, and we don't want that. We want our opponent to run out of cards way before us and let them die before we run out of stuff. So there is a danger there. There's also a danger in that it's just slow. It just cost of four to go find something. If that something's really good, you're probably not gonna be able to do it that turn if you're playing this on turn four. And I think that's the key. Search your feelings prior to the first super laser blast in this deck is almost always straight to the resource row. There is the occasional game where maybe on turn seven, I don't have the super laser, but I pay three to outmaneuver your exhaust all your dudes. And then I have the four to go get the super laser so I can deal with the five units I exhausted at the top of next turn. Sometimes that happens, but more often than not, 
we are not searching until like turn 10, 11, and we're, we're going to dig up the specific tool we need out of the tiny amount that's left of our deck before our opponent can try to rebuild after that super laser. So this is a very late game card. I would never play this on turn four. Uh, I guess maybe if your opponent has a terrible draw and they're not developing anything, but in, in a normal game state where you're under pressure, where the opponent is recruiting units to the field and those your arenas are both threatening pressure, you don't have time for this. So early game, this card most often goes to the row, but late game, this is something that is a problem fixer. I love searching for cards. I'm happy that this found a role in the deck, but I, I am also, I know this could be a controversial inclusion. I, and I understand why, because four to go search for one card, it is a lot, it's expensive, but sometimes you really, really need it. You need the card you need when you need it. So being able to get there makes a big difference. Uh, finally repair. And this is another potentially controversial inclusion in the deck. So pay one to heal three is not good. This is not good value, uh, but this card does a couple of really important things for us. In the aggressive matchup, healing for three sometimes makes the difference between living and dying. It can be really hard to get to turn seven. It can be impossible to get to turn eight against a deck that's coming on really, really strong, especially with finishers for Sabine with things like uh, uh, for a cause I believe in where they can just hit you in the face without even having to engage with the board. All their guys are exhausted, doesn't matter. This can kind of hedge against that. But also, this is a hedge against the slow control matchup that plays relentless. Because the problem we end up with when we are this event dependent is if somebody can stick a relentless and we don't have a good way to deal with it, we can just lose the game. Our deck doesn't do much without our events. So somebody plays relentless, we play repair to no effect, they do whatever they do, and then we vanquish that relentless. So having some events in the deck that can be kind of like dummy events that are really, really cheap is critical for us winning those late game control mirrors. And this is a deck that my strategy is we always win the control mirror. We always win control. We win a lot of the mid range and we struggle a little in aggro. That's, that's the life of a control player. We will always struggle a little with aggro. So it, it's true that I don't think this card is in a vacuum very good at all, but it serves two really important purposes for this deck uh, that I think cannot be ignored. So lastly, I want to take a look at part of the sideboard. So I feel like sideboards generally should be kind of catered to what you think you're gonna see at the upcoming event. However, with this deck, three of these cards are very specific for that control matchup, and those have been pretty much locked for a while. So I mentioned earlier that one of the problems I had was after I beat somebody with fatigue damage, they would come at me with 60 cards in game two. And that puts me in the position where I can only mill the 12 cards with vigilance. And now if I even search with search your feelings, we're, we're still kind of like in the same place. I can put myself into fatigue before you get to fatigue. That is unacceptable. That doesn't work. That's me losing to my own win condition. I can't tolerate that. And thus, what I discovered was restock has to come into the deck. So if it's a control mirror and I know my opponent is going to throw an extra 10 cards in their deck, I have to put restock into my deck. And restock lets me pick four cards out of my discard pile and put them on the bottom of my deck. If we're in the game two where this card has come in, what I'm trying to do is play Vigilance twice and then restock those two Vigilance back onto the bottom of my deck along with probably a Super Laser Blast and an Avenger. That's generally something like that other useful tools, maybe a cunning, depending upon the matchup, it might change. But the two that never change are the two vigilance. And it is possible once we get enough resources later in the game to pay one for restock, to put four cards on the bottom of the deck, pay four for search your feelings to search one of those cards out and then pay the six for vigilance and recycle it right there. And it devastates people. They do not like that. Now I realize that costs 11, but I want to point out, I go up to 12 resources with this deck. Now I'm not necessarily on 12 resources playing one resource a turn. I do play one resource a turn up until eight. And then at that point, I look at what I have. If I have a bib in my hand or Ferno in my hand, those cards can go to the row without much thought at all to get us from eight to 12. 
We don't want to end up in a situation where we need 10, where we need to super laser blast and then follow up with a no good to me dead or follow up with an entrenched and we don't have it. That's no good. But we also don't want to end up in a situation where we need that third Avenger and we don't have it because we put it into the row. So starting from the game all the way up until turn eight, we need to be rowing a card every single time. After that, from eight to 12, we have to be more selective about what we choose to put in our row and pay a little more attention to what our opponent is doing. If we've already destroyed half their deck and we're deep in the game, this is going to be turns where they're going to start underdropping weird stuff and where Boba Fett can come down and really do some work. If your opponent's like, man, I don't have anything else to play. I guess I'll play this three drop. It's like, okay, well, I have a much better three drop that can kill your three drop. And that's a line that you really need to pay attention. The other two cards that are in the permanent sideboard for this deck are the two copies of Chimera. Now, I mentioned earlier that I wanted to talk about this unit later, and the time has come to talk about the Chimera. I accept and understand that it is a flavor win for Thrawn to have his Star Destroyer in his deck. But it doesn't make the main deck because it is just weaker than Avenger. The biggest problem with the Chimera is that it doesn't do anything the turn it's played. It comes down, it's smaller stats than the Avenger, it does have a shield, which is relevant, and it, but its power doesn't do anything until it actually attacks. You have to attack with the Chimera, and then you can name a card, it forces the opponent to reveal their hand, and you get to discard a copy of the named card if you hit. So this is one of our layers of protection against Relentless and Devastator. It, layer one would be you see that Relentless on top of their deck turn six, you play Vigilance and put it straight to the discard pile. Layer two in game two, which is often when people have sided in their extra copies of these big heavy bombs because they know the game's going to go late. If we see that, say, on top of their deck turn seven, but we don't have the Vigilance or we have to use that turn to Super Laser Blast or something so we can't get rid of it off the top of the deck, we're able to get Chimera in play before either Relentless or Devastator can hit the board. And then if it lives long enough, we can get that attack in, declare that card, get it out of their hand, as well as just look at the whole hand. And then if we get a second swing with this thing, well, now we know what we're going for. Another advantage that Chimera has compared to Avenger when it comes to the Devastator issue is Devastator comes down and has to put all that damage into the shields. So Chimera can actually live in some situations where Avenger cannot. So there's a lot of value in these three cards that help us shore up the matches we need to be winning 100% of the time. The control, mirrors, heavier mid-range games, these are matches that we cannot afford to lose. These are our bread and butter. So these three cards are dedicated to facing those kind of matchups. The rest of the sideboard, the other seven cards, those are going to be to shore up your aggro matchup or to face specific problems or answer specific problems that you have in the meta for whatever event or locals that you're going to. The other seven slots in my sideboard at this time are devoted to trying to deal with the aggro matchup. So there are actually a bunch of units in there, Seventh Fleet Defenders to try to deal with those annoying A-Wings, uh, Death Troopers to try to deal with stuff on the ground. So that's what I'm signing in currently to try to shore up the aggro matchup. So when we're talking about mulligans with this deck, I think it's really important to think about the matchup. So the number one thing is look at what the opposing leader is and what are you going to need on that leader's flip turn? If it's Boba Fett, you're going to want an entrenched, you're going to want to know good to be dead. If it's Aiden, if it's Sabine, you're going to want takedown. If it's whoever, you're going to want answers. So either we entrench, no good to me, power the dark side, uh, take down, like there, there's all these options to deal with leaders, but we need to make sure that we have those options lined up. So that's kind of the first thing to look at your hand, say, hey, if I draw dead from here on out, am I going to have a way to deal with my opponent's flip turn? Because those flip turns can be real bursty. We don't want to let somebody just run roughshod over us on their flip turn. Next, I like to see low cost stuff. I don't want to row my Avenger. I don't want to row my Super Laser Blast on turn one. I will row Dooku. I will absolutely row Search Your Feelings. So there are some cards that I know I'm not going to use till really, really deep in the game. And they're too valuable. Like Super Laser Blast is too valuable to put into the row. I have to keep that in my hand. So I don't even want to see it in my opener. Dooku, on the other hand, is a little more situational. So I think you can safely throw him into the row and not feel like you're potentially costing yourself the game on the back end. It is 
more important than anything else with this deck is you have to think about what you're going to do next turn at all times, constantly. So on turn one, we need to make sure we get initiative because we want to be able to, whatever the card is that flips, that we reveal uh, on turn two, it's going to be big enough to exhaust your opponent's turn one play, basically always. I mean, it could be, I suppose there could be a weird situation where they play a two drop and we have repair on top of our deck and they have metal ceremony on top of theirs. That is an edge of an edge case. Generally speaking, reliably speaking, you want to have initiative in turn one. I would even go so far as to say, if my opponent wins the roll and they play a unit on turn one, even if I'm holding Inferno, which I really do want to play, I'll just claim initiative there. So I can go into turn two and exhaust their unit first. So there's the concept of banking damage where the opponent plays the unit. And if we can exhaust it, remove it, deal with it before it even attacks once, we're ahead. But if they're able to attack with that unit once and get that damage on our base, well, now, even if we remove the unit, they've already got value out of it. We don't want them to bank that damage onto our base because we move so slowly. Yes, we have a lot of healing and that is important to this deck but not taking the damage in the first place is the best form of healing. Now, admittedly, this is this deck can make you lose friends and make enemies. Uh, nobody likes to be controlled, and this is like one of the controlliest control decks there is. So be careful with this one, <laughs> taking it to locals. Uh, I definitely, when somebody says something to me like, man, that is really toxic, I just say, yep, you're right. I can't even defend myself. You're right. It is toxic to put three entrenched on your guys so you have a huge field but you can't do anything with it that's not the most fun way to lose a game but hey it, i enjoy trying to weather the storm from aggro and come back and win games by making many many good choices throughout the whole course of the game that's the way i enjoy to engage with these games while i fully understand that it can be very frustrating for folks to have their game plan and have their units and want to do their thing and to have me sit down across from them and no, I'm going to kill that. Nope, you can't do that. No, 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 not today. That can be an irritating experience for another player. That being said, when I'm playing this kind of control deck, well, control decks in general, you are making so many choices and it's so easy for one of the many decisions you make to go wrong and lose control of the game and have that aggro player just run you over, which maybe isn't the most fun for me. So let's let's think about the poor control players too, right? So here at the end, I kind of just want to run down some key concepts one last time and hammer home what the deck wants to do. This deck is reliant on Thrawn's power to look at what your opponent has come in and give you that extra little edge to make sure that your removal and disruption lines up in such a way that your opponent can't do anything. The goal is that we want to be at less than 10 damage when we play the first super laser blast. Most opponents will see this coming they will keep some things back and they won't overextend into the board. That's fine because they will overextend into the board for the second super laser blast. Not everyone, not always, but a lot of times that's what happens, especially if you play that first super laser, they play something, then you deploy. That tends to send a signal to the opponent that you're not going to super laser again because who would kill their own leader? I would. This guy. I will kill my own leader with a super laser blast if it's the correct play. And those are the kind of plays that you need to be looking for to make the Thrawn deck work. You have to think about what your opponent is thinking about, and they are going to try to counter you. They're going to try to flood the board when you've only got spot removal. They're going to try to go big when you only have takedown. So you need to make sure that your removal package lines up with what you see coming off the top of your opponent's deck. On some level, you have to be reactive. For example, if someone plays the gorilla attack pod and readies that thing, you need to have the no good to me dead to turn it sideways again. So, so in that sense, you have to react to what your opponent does, but you also have to be proactive because if you're all you're doing is take down, vanquish, power of the dark side after the units have attacked, that damage is already stacking up on you. And you might not survive to the point where fatigue damage or any of our big late game bombs matter. So you've got to be reactive to what they play, but be proactive in how you deal with it, which can be a very difficult needle to thread. And I think that's what I like about the deck so much is that it asks a lot of you as a player to try to make sure you're 
playing the right card at the right time. And often when games don't go my way, I can look back and say, ah, I should have used outmaneuver that turn instead of power of the dark side. That was the problem. Or I can point to specific moments where my decision making, maybe it felt like the right choice at the time, but it didn't work out. And now we can go back and look at, well, what would have happened if I had done it this way? And that's what I like about this deck so much is that it's very non-linear. You're, you're solving unique problems every time you sit down to play. And really the addressing of threats, your opponent has so much control over how you have to play that it, it puts you under pressure before the game even starts. And that, that's something I kind of like. Basically every deck you sit down across from, they're gonna be putting you on a clock and you need to figure out how to buy more time until you can destroy that clock with a super laser blast. All right, we'll see you in the arenas.